Hello, everyone. Um, so this is the webinar from um, CIBZ TM40, an overview. I'm Julie Godfroy, the technical manager at CIBZ and also the lead author of TM40. Um, I'll talk for about 35, 40 minutes, and then we'll have the rest of the time for questions and answers, and you can already type them. Some of you will get answers straight away, and others I will pick them up at the end. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to make this slides work. Yes. Um, so in this presentation, I will first give you an overview of TM40, then a brief um, going through the effects of the environment uh, on health, comfort and cognitive performance. Then we'll go through a section that I call what, um, and it is about what we can do to define performance criteria for health, comfort and well-being. Um, and then a brief overview of the main chapters in TM40, so humidity, air quality, thermal conditions, light, acoustics, electromagnetic fields and water quality. As you see, it's quite a broad scope, so it will really just be an overview um, as a taster. So the, um, I was the lead author, but there were a lot of people involved um, in the publication, including Public Health England and researchers, of which Marcella Uchi from UCL, and many, many consultants who were either on the steering group as peer reviewers and contributors. So it really is a broad disciplinary input into the publication. The scope, um, is pretty much it picks up from the old TM40 from 2006, uh, but it has expanded it. And essentially we cover what we call supportive environments. So the environments that can help deliver conditions for health, comfort and cognitive performance. What it doesn't really do, it hints at it, but it doesn't cover it in detail, is the health and safety end of the scale hazard, security, et cetera, which are well covered elsewhere. And on the other end, um, the, um, everything that contributes to our broader well-being, so beauty, happiness, belonging, et cetera. It's still just a CIBZ publication, so it focuses on health, comfort, and cognitive performance. We're covering the main environmental parameters that we know affect health, comfort, and performance. So they are the ones I mentioned before, thermal conditions, air quality, et cetera, uh, and also the interactions. It's obviously a little artificial to talk about them separately. So wherever we can in the publication, we point to where they link to other things. So thermal conditions and our perception of humidity are very linked for example. Um, and it's a publication that really covers all types of buildings, new and existing, housing and non-domestic, and also a little bit what we call the spaces in between, so to highlight the importance that the outside environment can play, not only on the indoor environment, but also on our broader health and comfort. Today, I will focus mainly on indoor environments, but that chapter is there for you. The, um, I apologize for the quality of this slide. Um, broadly, the approach we have taken throughout the guide is that um, on every theme, we first cover why. Um, so why it's important, for example, why thermal conditions are important for health, for comfort, for user satisfaction. And that's essentially based on a review of knowledge uh, of what's out there. Then what we call the what, which is how do you define performance criteria for health and comfort? What is a good indoor environment in order to, to be supportive to our performance? And largely that refers to regulation and the World Health Organization. Then once we have defined these performance criteria, we go into the how. How do you deliver these supportive environments. And that's the guidance, which starts from site assessments through to design, construction, operation, and maintenance. And finally, 
we have on every theme what we call emerging themes, which are all the exciting bits of research and product development and innovation. So all these things that are still debated and that might be coming in the future, which hopefully will trigger research and innovation, but also highlight actually limits of our knowledge. So places where you might want to put caveats to the guidance that you give to clients. <clears throat> The, um, obviously, it's a publication, so you can read it front to cover, but I suspect no one ever will. Um, it's structured in such a way that you can actually pick and choose the way you read it. So, for example, it may be that clients or people who are establishing a brief only want to read what we call the why. So, in every chapter, they can read the first section and know, okay, so I understand why all these factors are important if I want to deliver good conditions for health or good conditions for performance in an office. Um, and similarly, to set performance criteria, you might only ever read the sections two and three of every chapter. Um, so you can read it sort of across or throughout and it is structured in that way hopefully it also means that uh, at some point it could become an online publication that is more modular than the traditional CIPSI guides. <clears throat> um, we have tried to um, obviously as a CIPSI guide focus on the core scope of CIPSI members um, and that's places basically where CBZ members can lead a design. So for example, HVAC controls, HVAC design. Uh, and if we were talking about air quality as an example, it would be the location of the exhaust, the ventilation strategy, ventilation rate, filters, etc. cetera. Um, but you, no one discipline can deliver environmental conditions on their own. So we're also pointing with less and less amount of details to areas where there is a need to collaborate with other disciplines. Um, obviously with architects, with landscape architects, with interior designer, with a contractor, with the FM team, and also where we need to be aware of um, things that as designers we do not control, but which will influence the end performance of a building. So user behaviors and preference, outdoor conditions, FM resources, etc. So this is not to expand the scope of designers, but to really highlight the importance of collaboration across um, disciplines. Now we'll um, go on to the why. So this is a very brief overview um, of why um, there is so much more attention in the recent years on health and well-being and comfort. Um, and I think it's always uh, good to go back to, um, even if it's very high level, the UN Sustainable Development Goal. So goal number three is about health. Um, the UK has signed up to it. And the goal is divided into 13 targets from healthcare services, but also prevention and public health campaigning. And actually a 20, 2018 report on the progress of the UK towards the Sustainable Development Goals showed that for this goal, um, we're only scoring well in about half of the indicators um, and quite poorly on two indicators. The main reasons being outdoor air pollution, life expectancy at birth, which I'm sure you've heard on the news is actually slowing down the progress, um, and also a widening gap in life expectancy between the least and most um, deprived areas of the country. Um, <clears throat> another very important part, and there is only uh, it's only under partial control of designers, but it's wider space planning, neighborhood plannings and cities, and how that can influence our physical activity, fitness, and health in general, and social cohesion. And the statistics in the UK are actually um, pretty stark. Um, so the official statistics show that um, about half of adults and children have really very little physical activity, and this has lots of impacts on physical and mental health. And 
obviously um, this is individual behaviors but there is a lot of evidence that shows that the way the built environment is planned can make it easier um, for us to make the right healthy choices. Another um, driver we had in mind when we wrote the publication was health inequalities um, and in particular the link to the built environment. So there are about in the UK about nine years difference of life expectancy between the least and most deprived areas in the country and even more 18 years of healthy life difference between the least and most deprived areas. Um, so this is why we really wanted to talk about housing and neighborhoods and these spaces in between, so the provision of good air quality, of green spaces, of um, mixed neighborhoods that all encourage more healthy lifestyle and reduce um, the likelihood of inequalities. These are all official health statistics. We are really um, quite cautious about where we were getting our data from. <clears throat> Beyond health, um, obviously, particularly um, for those of you who work in co on commercial offices, um, we know a very big driver for the health and wellbeing agenda is productivity. Um, in the guide, we are covering that under cognitive performance because we don't only want to talk about, say, productivity in offices, but also other areas where it's quite important that we perform as well as we could, and in particular, learning in schools. Um, so this is why we have tended to use the term cognitive performance. We have done quite a large literature review of all the studies that show how indoor environments affect our performance, and that has... Uh, essentially informed where we thought that some of the guidance needed to be adjusted. Um, there are a lot of studies on this at the moment and some of them are of poor quality, to be blunt. So what we have also done in TM40 is give pointers to the sort of things that um, you can look for when you review one of these studies. So for example, if you read that changing a particular ventilation rate or changing a material in a building will make people X percent more productive, that sort of statement, um, there are many things that you can look for. Um, so for example, are we really looking at a very specific parameter? Is it well defined? Is it measurable? Are we sure that this is the only parameter that is changing? Or maybe there are other factors in the environment that are changing at the same time, which may affect people's performance. And also, how is performance defined? Are we talking about a small group of individuals who are working on a particular task? Or is it at the scale of the whole organization and there's actual outcomes, for example, um, human resources statistics on retention. Um, is it self-reported performance or measured? Is there a control group? So um, an important thing to look at in these studies is um, if a change was done in your environment, you might actually perform better or be happier for a small uh, amount of time just because something has changed and it's nice to get out of the routine. What is important to look at is, is that improvement sustained or only short term? And was there a group with no change where you can really show that the particular improvements you noticed were related to that change in the indoor environment? Um, so hopefully that will help you distinguish the good studies that you can trust and those that maybe you want to ignore. And I want to illustrate why it's really important when we talk about performance to differentiate whether it's a particular individual at a particular task or a whole organization. So it may be that studies show, say, 30% improvement in productivity, you know, people were typing quicker or responding much better, etc. But it might just be a small group in an organization who were busy being evaluated on only one of their tasks. When you take all of that at the level of the organization, the numbers that you get in terms of 
productivity improvements may be much smaller. Now, it doesn't mean that they're not important because, say, 1% improvement in productivity can result in really big um, actual financial outcomes. But we have to be a little bit careful about the figures that we give to clients when we justify our strategies. And there are now uh, more and more robust studies that really look across at individuals and organization outcomes. So I recommend that particular study, um, which showed that factors such as lighting, noise, temperatures, ventilation, control, all of these really do have quite an impact, but it's nowhere near the numbers you would get looking at a particular task. <clears throat> so all of that background review essentially helped us confidently um, establish recommended criteria, so what we call performance criteria. On new projects, it may be that you feel they can be targets for your indoor environments. On existing buildings, it may be that they're used as a benchmarks to establish where you might want to improve your building. Um, <clears throat> and um, looking at thermal comfort, um, we haven't actually changed much of the guidance. So we are very largely referring to other SIBZ publication. Um, so going back to the two approaches, PMV, PPD, which is quite prescriptive, and the adaptive comfort strategy, TM52 and TM59, etc. Um, in light, um, again, in terms of visual effects, we haven't really changed it, but I'll come to um, some of the evolution of criteria in the non-visual effects of light. In air quality, this is probably where, in terms of performance criteria, this TM is being the most updated compared to the rest of the CIPSI guidance. Because at the moment, um, across the industry, very often when we talk about air quality, we're actually relying on proxies in terms, instead of actual air quality metrics. So, for example, people might say there was good indoor air quality when, in fact, what they meant was no one was complaining that it was stuffy. Um, now, this is just um, user perception. And as we know, they could be very important pollutants that are actually not perceived, for example, carbon monoxide. So we can't rely on user perceptions alone to define the air quality of a building. Um, another proxy that is often used is people thought they were productive or people were productive. Um, again, how did you define that? I've talked about the difficulty of actually defining and assessing um, cognitive performance and productivity of people in relation to the indoor environment. The most commonly used proxy for air quality is ventilation rates. Now, that's actually just a design measure. It doesn't guarantee on its own that the indoor air quality will actually be good. The obvious example is if the outdoor air is polluted and we have very high ventilation rates, we will bring pollutants indoor and um, there won't be a good indoor environment. Finally, um, we quite often rely on indicators. For example, total volatile organic compound, TVOCs, or CO2. These, um, in large part, are okay if we know that they may not be, that there are no other potential pollutant sources. And if we're reasonably confident that the other design measures are about right, but they really are only indicators. Um, TVOCs on their own are not an actual pollutant. Some VOCs are very harmful, others much less so. So the approach we have taken in TM40 is to be much more specific. So instead of perceptions and satisfaction, we are looking to health-based metrics. Instead of design measures, we are recommending desired outcomes. And instead of indicators, we are focusing on actual pollutants. Um, which means that to define these performance criteria, we have gone back to health organizations, and in particular, the World Health Organization, to regulations in the UK in particular, um, and that has allowed us to recommend 
performance criteria. This is a bit of a simplification and I'll come to some of that. Uh, but in large part, we think that it covers sort of the majority environment to the best of our current knowledge. And then in comfort term, what is really important to remember, which the guide insists a lot on, is to provide user choice. So no one particular environment will satisfy everyone. Uh, and it's really important when we're talking about comfort to have some options for user to control, at least within a certain band, their environment. I said this is a simplification um, because in very large part, the guidance that we give and which is available from health organizations is for what is called, say, normal populations. And an actual very large part of the population is not that well covered um, by guidance. So vulnerable population, infants, the elderly, people who already have medical conditions, pregnant women. Typically, the broad guidelines don't really apply to them that well, or we don't know whether they apply to them that well. Uh, even in comfort terms, a large part of the guidance was historically based on men, um, much more than women in the surveys. An another really important simplification is that typically guidance is based on the impact of a particular environmental factor. So this pollutant has this particular effect or that level of noise has that particular effect. There are not that many comprehensive studies that look at the combination of factors and the impact it has on us. And in fact, of course, in real life, we know that they're often combined. So we might be exposed to several pollutants. We might live next to a busy road, which means it's noisy and we can't open the windows so it gets too hot which is why we have to be quite cautious and why there is some margin built into the guidelines. Now, this is the end of the overview and I will go through individual sections one by one. A bit of a whisk through because it really is to give you a flavor of what is covered uh, when the publication is actually available. So the first um, chapter is humidity and there very largely, uh, we have uh, reinstated and expanded a bit on existing SIBSI guidance. Um, <clears throat> so the, the effects of humidity, actually, we, we are quite, most of us are quite tolerant to, to, to a broad range of humidity levels. Uh, and the issues are in the extremes. So if there's too high humidity levels, you might essentially encourage the growth of um, pollutants or house dust mites, etc. Humidity on its own is not an issue for health. It's what it supports. Um, it's also an issue, obviously, for comfort, thermal comfort. And we know that actually in some climates is becoming a very serious health risk because high temperatures and high humidity levels mean that our body can't get rid of the heat. And last year, there were the first headlines of actually hundreds of people at death in these particular climates. The other end of the scale is very low levels of humidity, where again, it's not so much a health issue, but it's more a discomfort issue if the air is too dry. Um, and we know that this is happening, particularly in winter in offices with very high ventilation rates, where humidity levels can be quite low and uh, complaints occur. There is um, no World Health Organization guidance on um, the levels and it's more about a combination of ventilation rate and surface temperatures. Um, and in that case, we have re essentially retained the existing guidance from SIBSI on relative humidity rates. <clears throat> Where it's really important, and here the guidance points to other publications because it's a huge topic on its own, is in uh, the context of retrofit, and in particular the risk of moisture 
uh, building up inside the walls or on surfaces and materials degrading, etc. We anticipate that this is an area that will become more and more prominent uh, we, as we embarked on large scale retrofit to reach the UK carbon reduction targets. So we have put a lot of references for uh, more guidance on controlling condensation risk and also guide uh, um, case studies on retrofits that deliver both health benefits and energy efficiency benefits. Next section is air quality. Um, as I said, this is one of the most significant updates and compared to the rest of SIBSI guidance and it's also the largest chapter in TM40. Um, and um, guidance we thought was really needed because first of all we now all um, know very well that outdoor pollution levels exceed guidelines um, uh, across the world really particularly in cities um, we also understand increasingly well how the combination of indoor pollutants is affecting our health and um, there is no comprehensive regulatory framework that actually looks at indoor air quality. To take back um, the example of the UK, approved document F, um, to guidance related to building regulations, is actually not really looking at indoor air quality. It very much focuses on ventilation and it looks at pollutants from the indoors. So it looks at, for example, um, NOx, levels as recommended guidelines but from indoor sources so it's not sufficient on its own we think to guarantee levels that would be in line with um, WHO recommendations for example. Um, this is just a very um, um, partial illustration of what I mean but for example if we look at these three pollutants PM10 the WHO recommendations are on the lower end of the scale, so the left-hand side of the slide. And um, actually, indoors, we don't have regulations in the UK that look at this. The well standard has um, a recommended level, but that's about it. There's no indoor air quality limit in the UK on PMs, and there are some limits on outdoor levels of PM, but they are much higher than the WHO recommendations and as we know they are very often not met. Hence uh, we thought the need for comprehensive guidance and in here SIBSI are quite in line with the way that other standards and other organizations are going. So for example British standards and ISO standards are increasingly referring to the WHO. So it's not only SIBSI taking down that route. Um, Public Health England are also going in the same way. We wanted to supplement this with guidance on where to start from because um, otherwise you could be facing a whole suite, potentially a long list of pollutants without quite knowing what to prioritize. So in the guidance section we have um, basically given advice on the most likely pollutants, starting with the outdoors, um, how to start your site assessment, benchmark levels of what you might be expecting in some cities, just to give you a feel for the most likely pollutants that you will have to address in your design strategies. In the UK, uh, I mean, you can be pretty much guaranteed, unfortunately, that particulate matter levels would be higher than WHO guidelines. We are also um, recommending a hierarchical approach. So as I said, starting with a site assessment uh, at say the local authority level and going to increasing levels of accuracy about your actual site and taking that into consideration as a very first step in the way you plan the layout of your building and of your site. So the classic example, if you can see on the photo, the um, oh, sorry, <laughs> um, the photo on the left top side um, is a single aspect dwellings that are onto a busy road. Um, 
once you start with a design like this, it's then extremely difficult to guarantee a good indoor environment. The place will probably be noisy. Uh, it may get too hot because you can't open the windows. And if you do, you're exposed to high pollution levels. So really starting from strong collaboration with architects on the building layout before you apply mechanical systems and filtration, because that is more expensive, more, co um, more costly to run, probably it will require more maintenance and it's less resilient. Another area where we have updated the guidance is on filtration. There are quite a few new standards that hopefully will help you assess what filters are needed if you do need filters. Um, we also have a small section on measures that can be taken through construction to ensure that your design measures are followed through and then in operation and maintenance with quite a lot on monitoring but also on the basics of good FM and good completion of projects, for example, duct cleaning uh, to ensure that pollutants that accumulated during the construction do not end up in the indoor environment. Indoor environmental quality monitoring is a very big to topic we know in the industry. There is a lot of work going on. Um, we have summarized um, essentially the different types of monitoring strategies and also given prompts to help you develop the appropriate monitoring strategy, starting with why do you want the data from? What sort of data do you want? And it's important to differentiate a contractual context. For example, you might want to prove or to check that what you had specified has actually been delivered. Uh, and in that case, we would recommend using accredited labs and accredited equipment, for example, following UCAS. That's one end of the scale. If on the other hand, what you want is more to follow general trends and to raise awareness, of indoor environmental quality, you may be able to go for sensors that are much less accurate, but which you know show directions and which are cheaper and you can have many more of them, they can be more interactive, etc. If you are interested in this topic, our CBZ Air Quality Working Group um, is looking at it and they produced uh, last week a short publication on VOC. So uh, they are very much continuing the work that TM40 started on this topic. R&D is very, very active in indoor environmental, uh, indoor air quality. So we have quite a big section of emerging themes. Um, I'm sure you have heard about some of them. So the very exciting ones are the impact of plants. Um, our review shows that um, if you do have impacts of indoor air quality from plants, they are likely to be quite small. It's not a reason not to put plants into a buildings, obviously, but don't expect that you're going to have a massive impact. However, again, this is an active um, research topic, which CIBZ are still looking at with other universities. Um, we have also given pointers about how to assess the claims made by different manufacturers of products. Um, so, for example, wool absorbs VOCs and titanium dioxide paints uh, absorbs uh, VOCs. Some of these products, um, you know, at best, they are not doing much, but they're not doing much harm either. Others, um, it's a fairy tale. <laughs> Um, promises or potentially actually have um, they have a detrimental effect. So you might see a study that shows that a particular product absorbs or degrades or magically makes disappear particular pollutants. But what you need to ask yourself is, well, what is the process by which that pollutant apparently disappears? Is it being turned into a byproduct that is actually worse than what was there in the first place? So we have given pointers on this as well. And um, finally, a very active area in indoor air quality is the debate around carbon dioxide and whether it really is an indicator of air quality, which is how traditionally it has been treated, or an actual pollutant on its own. So there, there is actually no health 
based limit for general environments on carbon dioxide. There are some that are very, very high uh, for occupational health, um, but none actually from the WHO for general environments. And usually it's seen as an indicator of ventilation effectiveness. So simplistically, do you have enough ventilation for the number of people that are in the room? Uh, and it's obviously very important when we're talking about saving energy and carbon because you can reduce your ventilation rates with demand control linked to CO2 levels. Um, there are many, many studies, however, that are hinting at CO2 having an effect on its own. And the first word of caution is most of these studies actually don't look at CO2 on its own. What they do is vary ventilation rates. So they may vary other parameters than just CO2. But more recently, there have been some, uh, quite often coming from Harvard, which specifically looked at CO2. So what they did is they kept all parameters the same um, in an office and they essentially introduced CO2 into the supply air. So you know uh, nothing else changed but that. Um, and tests appear to show on small samples of participants, as you can see on the graph uh, on the right hand side of this slide, that a lot um, of our performance tests, particularly decision-making tests, actually uh, we perform, people perform worse under higher CO2 levels. Um, so this was often very poorly translated in the media, in the general media, as you know, uh, CO2 levels leading potentially to car crash, um, plane crashes uh, because of levels in pilot cabins. Um, again, going back to the guidance I talked about in the earlier section, what um, actually are we looking at? The ranges, um, so that's the red colored ranges, the ranges where most of the really strong effects that are observed are already way higher than current guidance by SIBZ, ASHRAE, ISO, etc. The current recommended guidelines still seem quite appropriate and with if the guidelines are actually followed there doesn't seem to be at the moment strong evidence that we should reduce CO2 levels and we would then get better performance. So that's a, um, I think an important illustration that when we look at these studies linking performance and indoor environments we should always go back to check what is already recommended before increasing ventilation rates, there could be unintended consequences. So much higher ventilation rates would link to higher energy consumption. They may also lead to much lower humidity levels and complaints from occupants about dry air, for example. Right, so now moving on to th um, the other sections, which are much smaller, um, thermal conditions. Broadly speaking, the, um, there is not that much new material in TM40 or new recommendations. What it does is collate the knowledge up to there. Um, so obviously we cover overheating risk, uh, and in that and in there we very much refer back to TM59 and TM52. Um, but we also, and it's important to remember it, cover winter comfort. Now we hear a lot about deaths related to heat waves, but in the UK, there are many more winter excess deaths than there are summer excess deaths, even in heat wave years. Um, it's a bit complicated because winter excess deaths include flu, and there's, um, there's no statistics that manage to differentiate the impact of one and the other, but it still dwarfs and is still predicted to dwarf with climate change in 2050, the number of deaths from summer. So it's still really important to think about winter comfort, particularly when we talk about housing retrofit. Um, the guidance, as I said, um, really um, remains in line with the current one and it talks, um, so you know about the benefits of passive design and strategies that deliver both winter comfort and summer comfort. Um, so, for example, the illustration of the child on, 
by the window with the snow. Um, that's to say Passive House was first um, developed as a comfort standard, so you can be uh, next to surfaces that are still comfortable to sit next to. Uh, we're talking about natural ventilation, external shading, and the importance of user control so that you can cater for different populations, including uh, women who supposedly are always cold uh, when actually, well, maybe temperatures were not designed for them in the first place. We also um, very clearly link that chapter to the acoustics guidance be, um, because we know that a lot of overheating cases in residences are very strongly linked to noise levels outside preventing windows from being open too often. The next chapter is light um, and there is um, um, again quite, um, it's a substantial chapter um, because light affects us in so many ways. Um, one of the impacts is radiation, and there there isn't that much new guidance in TM40. The other impact is visual aspects, and again, TM40 there is very much in line with current guidance from CIBZ and the Society of Light and Lighting. Um, and uh, as I'm sure you all know, um, the very active topic about light and health and well-being is non-visual effects and what is often called circadian lighting or human-centric lighting. Um, it's a very exciting topic because it all relates back to receptors in our eyes that were only discovered in 2002. Uh, I, um, so very recently we're still finding out really interesting things about the impact of environments on us. Um, what we can say about the non-visual effects of light on our health um, is that it's really important when we talk about that to look at, to talk about the spectrum of the light source. Um, it's also really important to understand that there is a consensus, people, the experts agree that light and different parts of the spectrum affect us and affect our circadian rhythm. So how well we sleep at night, how alert we are during the day. However, there is no single accepted metric at the moment. It really is very much in development. And the one, the one put forward by the well building standard is actually only one of many. And you may have noticed that recently well have actually accepted other metrics in that recognition that this is a really evolving field of knowledge. It's a um, very complicated field because what we increasingly understand also is that it's quite possible that we won't be able to say to recommend one particular metric and one particular level because it's time dependent. So the same type and level of light might not affect us in the same way depending on our exposure in the last 24 hours. The reason why it's so important is not only this development in you know, our fundamental knowledge of health and how our body works, but also the parallel development and widespread adoption of LEDs, which not always, but often end up, as you can see in the graphs on the right hand side, end up with quite a peak in the blue part of the spectrum. That part that is supposed to make us more alert, uh, or also, as again, you probably all know, um, that part of the spectrum that tends to keep us awake because we stupidly looked at our phone when we went to bed um, and tried to sleep. Um, so very broadly here, um, TM40 gives a summary of what we know, of what we don't know, and we have concluded that we are not at the stage where we can recommend a metric and a particular level but what all of this new knowledge does is reiterate guidance that is already there on the importance of daylight, the importance of views out, and the importance of good products so that we don't end up <coughs> with, <coughs> excuse me, products that are excessively bright, excessively cool, excessively glary, etc. That um, develops what I've just said. So the importance of daylight, again, the importance of controls, for example, task lighting, 
uh, and something that often designers um, uh, find difficult to influence because the way buildings are procured, but which is the interaction with interior design. So where furniture is and the types and the colors of surfaces, very often lighting models are done on standard assumptions when actually wherever possible we should collaborate with the interior designer. So um, the example at the bottom of this slide, the two images show the same lighting and uh, environment but actually with very different surfaces an impression um, that there is um, it's much more gloomy and much darker on the right hand side um, so it's really important where we can and I know it's difficult on some projects to be involved with the fit out designers to make sure that everything is coordinated I'll now go quickly over the last few sections. So in acoustics, um, um, a big topic that we are mentioning is overheating in residences. Uh, and there, there are different parameters. So as I've said, uh, the importance of building layout at the beginning of establishing what the outside conditions are and wherever possible having, say, residences and bedroom away from sources of noise ideally dual aspect so that you have potentially an elevation that is quieter and you can also if you can open on both sides and create a breeze which helps both uh, overheating and maybe air quality in some cases um, we are also um, giving a little bit more guidance on open plan office layouts because we know that with a big trend in office open plan offices the last few years there have been a bit of a I don't want to say backlash, but a revisit so that different needs are catered for. Um, so providing different types of spaces for different activities. Um, and we're also insisting on um, criteria from noise from building services. Again, we know that this is quite an issue in residences. So ventilation systems, whether they are MEVs or MVHR, which are actually poorly installed and commissioned, which means that they are either switched off by occupants, which means that indoor air quality becomes pretty bad, or um, run, but are very noisy and disturb occupants. There are very interesting areas of research as well. We have um, collaborated on this topic with the ANC, who are developing um, guide so that's the association of noise consultants who are working closely with us to develop joint guidance or guidance that refers to ours on heat and noise um, there's also development such as acoustically attenuated um, openings so natural ventilation with a little bit of acoustic ventilation trying to get acoustic attenuation trying the, to get the best of both worlds essentially and um, very exciting developments in soundscapes um, quite often linked to uh, the benefits of natural environment. Electromagnetic fields. Um, now we're actually quite pleased to have this chapter because it's not often talked about in the sphere of health and well-being but it's a really important um, field for our health as the WHO say it's actually one of the um, factors of our environment which is most changed uh, when we look at the last 20 years you know the mobile phones wi-fi electrifications around the world etc and we shouldn't dismiss the anxiety that this is creating among some populations so what this chapter does is give an update on knowledge of the effects um, of electromagnetic fields and very very recent updated guidance from who agencies on this up to last year, um, the guidance on exposure from this field was actually quite old and only based on short-term exposure when Wi-Fi didn't even exist. Um, so it's quite reassuring that now the guidance does take these new types of fields into account. We're also providing tools um, so that if you do get questions from pro uh, on projects about people who are maybe quite anxious about the, for example, the impact um, 
of a transformer, you hopefully have some pointers to the sort of things you might be able to tell them and the exposure levels that they might be exposed to and the guidance from officials. Um, the good news is that in the UK, Public Health England uh, say that broadly we're fine. Um, so exposure levels as measured generally are lower than the recommended maximums and so that's the first piece of good news the other piece of good news is that having now um, been exposed for several decades to some of these fields it seems that the original guidance is still valid we haven't necessarily discovered long-term effects we didn't know about which would require a revisit of our guidance um, i would really urge however people to stay informed because I have noticed increasingly people being you know members of the public being quite anxious about things such as 4G and 5G and there is really a lot of misinformation sometimes because communications from health agencies isn't very clear so hopefully this chapter will provide some tools. Um, last chapter is um, water quality. Um, there's not that much new guidance again, but we wanted to review what we knew of um, what is happening in the UK in particular. And we are quite conscious that um, schemes such as the well bending standards sometimes have uh, maybe inadvertently created the impression that water quality needs to be improved. Now, in the UK, 99.96% uh, of tests meet um, the required standards and in very, very large part, the UK requirements are more onerous than the WHO. Um, and actually, you may be more at risk of creating a hazard by adding, say, filtration or purification systems, especially if they're not well maintained. So if you have any doubts, obviously, and if your clients are very interested, of course, do some tests to check the quality of the supply. And I think um, it does happen that sometimes quality isn't appropriate, for example, due to old lead pipe work. But in very large part, UK water supplies are supposed to be reliable. And when there's an incident, populations know very, very quickly. So it's unlikely that it would affect your building. We would also caution against some on-site measures such as filters and purification systems that are actually not RAS approved. So it could really create a problem to designers if they were trying to put them in the building. That's it, I'm really um, sorry that I overrun, but as I hope you see, this covers a lot um, and I'm very happy to stay for questions. I leave you with the key takeaways of source control, precautionary principles, and a simple resilient design followed by good O&M and monitoring. Haha, um, so I'm going to read out um, the questions. Um, so the first question is, is there any indication of when part or all of this guidance will be incorporated into building regulations, national specs, etc.? Um, so we're only SIBSI, <laughs> so God knows what government will do with building regulations. Um, we certainly are in touch with government and in particular MHCLG who are in charge of building regulations. Some of it slowly is informing regulation. So um, in overheating terms, government has said that they would create new overheating standards and um, members of the SIBSI technical teams were on the PARTEF working group. We will certainly respond to the consultation, but it's very difficult to know at the moment where government will go, if anywhere. Um, the other avenue is that we are quite um, closely working with Public Health England who give advice to government. Um, that's about as specific as we can be, unfortunately. Um, the second question, thank you, Julie, that was interesting. Thank you very much. When is TM40 
software being released on the CIPSI website. So it should really be uh, in the next few weeks. I know some of you have been waiting for that for a while. Uh, so have I, so that I can move on to something else. But it, we were hoping to have it for Build to Perform next week. What will probably happen is that we will have the exact summary uh, next week which gives quite a lot of information already and then the publication in itself the, in the few following weeks. Um, that's it. Is there any more question? We still have the time if some of you have more questions or you can obviously send questions afterwards. I will move on to the slide with my email address if you do have questions. Um, that's it. All right, um, uh, will the presentation be available afterwards? Yes, of course, with the slides. Okay, well, if there are no more questions, we're going to wrap up. So, ah, uh, there is a question on CO2. In terms of CO2 measurement, is it for ventilation rate and ventilation effectiveness measurements? What other sort of gas will you take into account for IQ monitoring? Um, so that will really depend on the situation, but the publication gives advice on the most likely pollutants you are to find. Um, so in particular, for ex that will depend on your context and the site assessment. So if you are in a polluted area, uh, you might want to monitor PM and NOx in some situations, although that's difficult to monitor. If you are in an office environment or in some residential environments, uh, it may be that you want to take total VOC measurements. And if these are higher than recommended guidelines, then you can do more analysis to find out what particular VOC is there. It's quite contextual and we are giving guidance on how the context may lead you to one avenue or another. For example, if a place has recently been refurbished or there is new furniture, uh, it's quite possible that you would want to look at VOC levels because they are most likely to have been affected by the refurbishment. Uh, but we are giving hints for what to look at. Um, so the next question, uh, where are we? Are there any plans to link up with Well Institute as BRE have done recently for BRIAM? Um, so the, uh, I'm a Well AP, so uh, we certainly had the Well Building Standard in mind when we wrote this, and the IWBI were the initial, uh, so the, init the International Well Building Institute were the initial steering group meetings. Um, there are no plans to formally link because CIBZ uh, is very standard agnostic. So, you know, CIBZ guidance is never uh, advocating for particular environmental or sustainability schemes such as WELL or BRIAM. Um, but we certainly have referred to relevant WELL credits in the guidance. And there is also um, pages, uh, guidance already available from CIBZ, which is called Well Mapping, um, which uh, you can find on the website and which essentially links well credits with available CIBZ guidance and regulation. So that's the way we have done it. It's more to point to the links rather than formally do it. Um, so the next question, some VOCs will be live in the indoor environment for years. Are we taking account for this measurement in industry for now? Um, I'm not, I'm sorry, I'm not too sure what the question means. So if you wouldn't mind um, adding uh, something more specific, because I, I'm not sure I understand the question. So I will move on to the next back and come back to that if you add a clarification. Um, have you reviewed an assess reset as part of your research for this publication? And if so, what did you conclude. Um, so yes, we looked at it a little and we also talked to some consultants who had um, some experience of it. Um, we didn't, you know, in detail look at this one instead of 
others. Uh, our impression at the time, and uh, this was a few months ago, was that we were likely to categorize it, um, if you remember how I explained, you know, it depends what you are after. So probably more in the category of awareness raising and following trends as opposed to giving accurate, reliable, repeatable um, measurement in a contractual context. However, uh, we are you know, very happy to revisit this if there is evidence of the contrary. Um, at the time, our understanding was that the, uh, the equipment and the methods uh, for measurements didn't follow the international standards. So it doesn't mean um, that we are advising against it, but they wouldn't be in the um, contractual context, um, our recommendation. Uh, I'm sorry, we're going to have to leave it here because it's one o'clock, but thank you very much for all your questions. Um, and goodbye. Have a good day.